Chapter 18 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cal Taylor, Conestoga, Pennsylvania. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 8, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Tennessee Free. The appointment of Andrew Johnson as military governor of Tennessee and his assumption of active duty at Nashville in the spring of 1862 have been mentioned. The successive Union victories at Fort Donelson, Shiloh, Corinth, and Memphis seem to have completely paralyzed rebellion in the middle and western portions of the state. Various Union manifestations in the shape of public meetings and conventions occurring at Nashville, Columbia, Murfreesboro, Shelbyville, and perhaps other places, indicated that popular thought was turning towards a restoration of civil government under federal authority. This tendency, however, was arrested when in the autumn Bragg conceived and executed his daring invasion of Kentucky. Even after his forced retreat and the severe losses which the Ar Union Army inflicted on him in the battles of Perryville in October, and of Murfreesboro on December 31, 1862, it was apparent that the federal military control in Tennessee was not yet permanently assured, and this uncertainty blighted such official efforts at Reconstruction as were set on foot. President Lincoln had hoped for more favorable results in this direction. He had written to Governor Johnson and to General Grant on October 21st, a letter which was in substance a copy of which on October 14 he sent to the military governor of Louisiana, requesting that an opportunity be given to the people of Tennessee to hold a popular election for members of Congress, state officers, and the legislature, his primary object being to awaken and crystallize dormant Union sentiment, with a view as much as possible to detach captured localities and generally insurrectionary states from their military support to the rebellion. Both Governor Johnson and General Grant complied with the President's request so far as to publish orders for holding an election on December 29th to fill vacancies in the 37th Congress for 9th and 10th Congressional Districts of Tennessee. But though the Union voters were alert and made an effort to choose representatives, the rebel General Forrest planned and executed an extensive raid on that day, which prevented the election being held. Neither was there any early improvement in a political situation. For six months after the Battle of Murfreesboro, General Rosecrans made no forward movement. This left the strong rebel army of Bragg planted near the center of the state, where its mere presence was sufficient to deter Unionists from openly declaring their loyalty, except such of the bolder leaders as has been out spoken against secession and rebellion through all the incidents and fluctuations of the war from time to time they encouraged each other and kept alive what there was of latent loyalty by meetings speeches and resolutions on the first of july eighteen sixty three a union convention met at nashville which had been called by a committee consisting of w g brownlow horace maynard and thirteen others forty counties were represented though only partially by regularly chosen delegates, many of them simply enrolling their names as citizens. They took an oath of allegiance to the United States, and in their resolutions pronounced void the various succession laws and ordinances. They further declared it to be virtually important to elect a legislature and invited Governor Johnson to issue writs of election as soon as expedient. But it was clear to all prudent observers that the time was not yet ripe for such a step. General Hurlbut, writing from Memphis, under date of August 11, in answer to the President's letter of July 31, about Reconstruction in Arkansas, said, As to Tennessee, I am satisfied that this state is ready, by overwhelming majorities, to repeal the act of secession, establish a fair system of gradual emancipation, and tender herself back to the Union. I have discouraged any action on this subject here until... East Tennessee is delivered. When that is done, so that her powerful voice may be heard, 
let Governor Johnson call an election for members of the legislature, and that legislature call a convention, and in sixty days the work will be done. It was not long before the favorable conjecture that outlined seemed to have arrived. Rosecrans at length moved forward, forced Bragg by slow degrees southward to the state line, and on September 9 marched, unopposed, into Chattanooga. Coincident with this, Burnside, at the head of the Army of the Ohio, moved forward from Kentucky into East Tennessee, entering Knoxville on September 4. Hard fighting was still to be done to hold these points, but this also was successfully accomplished when Burnside, on November 29, repulsed Longstreet, and when, by the Battle of Chattanooga on November 24, the army of Bragg at length suffered disastrous defeat. Meanwhile, President Lincoln, not losing a moment of time after hearing of the occupation of Chattanooga, and studying his moves on the political chessboard as unremittingly as those on the military, wrote to Governor Johnson under the date of September 11. All Tennessee is now clear of armed insurrectionists. You need not be reminded that it is the nick of time for reinaugurating a loyal state government. Not a moment should be lost. You and the cooperating friends there can be better judge of the ways and means that can be judged by any here. I only offer a few suggestions. The reinauguration must not be such as to give control of the state and its representation in Congress to the enemies of the Union, driving its friends there into political exile. The whole struggle for Tennessee will have been profitless to both state and nation if it so ends that Governor Johnson is put down and Governor Harris is put up. It must not be so. You must have it otherwise. Let the Reconstruction be the work of such men only as can be trusted for the Union. Exclude all others and trust that your government, so organized, will be recognized here as being the one of Republican form to be guaranteed to the state and to be protected against invasion and domestic violence it is something on the question of time to remember that it cannot be known to who is next to occupy the position i now hold nor what he will do i see that you have declared in favor of emancipation in tennessee for which may god bless you get emancipation into your new state government constitution and there will be no such word as fail for your case. The raising of colored troops, I think, will greatly help every wary. The foregoing letter of general advice the President followed up a week later by sending the governor these additional documents, investing him with full powers to execute the work he was requested to do. Herewith I send you a paper, substantially the same as the one drawn by yourself and mentioned in your dispatch, but slightly changed in two particulars. First, yours was so drawn that I authorized you to carry into effect the fourth section, etc., whereas I so modified as to authorize you to act as to require the United States to carry into effect that section. Secondly, you had a clause committing me to some sort of to the state constitution of Tennessee, which I feared might embarrass you in making a new constitution if you desire, so I dropped that clause. This letter contained an enclosure which further said, In addition to the matters contained in the orders and instructions given you by the Secretary of War, you are hereby authorized to exercise such powers as may be necessary and proper to enable the loyal people of Tennessee to present such a Republican form of state government as will entitle the state to the guarantee of the United States, therefore, and to be protected under such state government by the United States against invasion and domestic violence, all according to the fourth section of the fourth article of the Constitution of the United States. For a month or more after these letters were sent, military operations about Chattanooga created anxious suspense, and before it was entirely believed by the full news following the Battle of Lookout Mountain, the President had issued his amnesty and reconstruction proclamation of December 8, 
1863. The great pressure of business both at Washington and Nashville and the midwinter weather created still further delay. About the middle of January, however, the president sent to Tennessee, as he had done to Louisiana, Arkansas, and elsewhere, an agent with blank books and instructions to begin and push forward the work of enrolling citizens willing to take the oath prescribed in the Amnesty and Reconstruction Proclamation. Governor Johnson, on his part, was by this time also ready to begin Reconstruction proceedings. A large public meeting was held at Nashville, January 21, at which he made a stirring speech, using his afterwards famous phrase that treason must be made odious, traitors must be punished and impoverished, declaring slavery dead, and that political reorganization must leave it altogether out of view. The meeting passed resolutions recommending a constitutional convention and pledging their influence to elect only such men as delegates to said convention as shall be in favor of immediate and universal emancipation the governor however was resolved to build the new political structure with the greatest caution to this end on january twenty sixth eighteen sixty four he issued a proclamation ordering election on the first saturday in march only for county officers justices of the peace sheriffs constables trustees circuit and county court clerks registers and tax collectors it was not easy immediately to restore the good will which theoretically goes hand in hand with peace the passions of civil war were made doubly bitter by rebel persecutions of union men in east tennessee excited loyalists found fault with the amnesty proclamation because of its excessive liberality to repentant rebels and its placing them in the same category with men always loyal it is galling in the extreme wrote horace maynard to many of our best union men officers and soldiers in the army and others to be transmitted to prosperity as they express it on the same record with men reeking with treason the governor therefore framed the oath of allegiance in his own proclamation a little more stringently than that in the president's and in this variance naturally produced discussion and delay and brought new protest and appeals to the president in reply he telegraphed to maynard of course governor johnson will proceed with reorganization as the exigencies of the case appear to him to require i do not apprehend he will think it necessary to deviate from my views to any ruinous extent on one hasty reading i see no such deviation in his program which you send and to warren jordan in county elections you had better stand by governor johnson's plan otherwise you will have conflict conflict and confusion i have seen his plan still further explanation was given in another letter a week later your telegram of the twenty sixth instant asking for a copy of my dispatch to warren jordan esq at nashville press office has just been referred to me by governor johnson in my reply to mr jordan which was brief and hurried i intended to say that in the county and the state elections of tennessee the oath prescribed in the proclamation of governor johnson on the twenty sixth of january eighteen sixty four ordering an election in tennessee on the first saturday in march next is entirely satisfactory to me as a test of loyalty of all persons proposing or offering to vote in said election and coming from him would better be observed and followed there is no conflict between the oath of amnesty and my proclamation of eighth december eighteen sixty three and that prescribed by governor johnson in his proclamation of the twenty sixth ultimo no person who has taken the oath of amnesty of 8th December 1863 and obtained a pardon thereby, and who intends to observe the same in good faith, should have any objection to taking that prescribed by Governor Johnson as a test of loyalty. I have seen and examined Governor Johnson's proclamation, and am entirely satisfied with his plan, which is to restore the state government and place it under the control of citizens truly loyal to the government of the united states the proposed election was duly held such returns of this election of march five as have become public and accessible are so meagre 
that they afford no sufficient data for general historical conclusions. Doubtless, the event was influential in confirming and renewing the faith of loyalists, but probably its larger result was drawing the attention of repentant rebels to the chances it offered to rehabilitate themselves and their political rights through the President's proclamation of amnesty. We may infer that the incident created much commitment and inquire in this particular, for on the 26th of March, President Lincoln issued a supplementary proclamation explaining and defining that of the previous 8th of December, to the extent of excluding from its provisions prisoners of war in confinement or on parole, or prisoners held for other offenses. It is evident that the success of the county elections in March was not such as to prompt an immediate popular movement towards full state reconstruction, as been hoped by Governor Johnson and the President. The question sank in the abeyance until, again prompted by the irrepressible Union leaders of East Tennessee, the conventions held in that region in the early part of 1861, which protested so energetically against secession, seemed to have kept their organization alive, to a certain extent, by a sort of permanent committee. This committee appears to have assembled a convention at Knoxville in April or May 1864 to discuss Reconstruction. It would seem that the meeting was divided into sentiment over the slavery question and made two reports, one favoring the Crittenden resolution, the other demanding emancipation, and this antagonism probably re prevented further action, for we will next find a call signed by Brownlow and others for a new convention, which was held in Nashville on September 5, 1864. Some 40 or 50 counties were again represented, but as before, many of them by irregular or volunteer delegates. Nevertheless, they held a spirited meeting and outlined a comprehensive program. They recommended the election of a constitutional convention and the abolition of slavery in the state, and also made provisions for taking part in the approaching presidential election. This program was, however, only partially carried out. On September 30, Governor Johnson issued his proclamation for holding the presidential election, and the Union voters cast their ballots for electors of president and vice president, so far as the unsettled condition of military operations permitted. On September 30, Governor Johnson issued his proclamation for holding the presidential election, and the Union voters cast their ballots for electors of president and vice presidents so far as the unsettled condition of military operations permitted. It does not appear that at the election of November 1864, any attempt was made to choose a governor or legislature or constitutional convention for Tennessee, but the convention which met in July constituted an executive committee consisting of five members for each division of the state. This executive committee after the presidential election was over, issued calls for a state convention to meet in Nashville on December 19, 1864. The people meet, said the call, to take such steps as wisdom may direct to restore the state of Tennessee to its once honored status in the great national union. If you cannot meet in your counties, come upon your own personal responsibility. It is the assembling of Union men for the restoration of their own commonwealth to life and a career of success. It turned out that the contemplated meeting could not take place on a day designated because of the advance of the rebel army under Hood upon Nashville, and a meeting was therefore postponed to January 9, 1865. By that time, the Battle of Nashville had once more freed Tennessee from hostile occupation and the appointed state convention assembled. Fifty-eight counties and some regiments were represented by about 467 delegates who deliberated six days. The main act of the convention was in the following words. We, the people of the state of Tennessee and of the United States of America, in convention assembled, do propound the following alterations, and amendments to the Constitution, which, when ratified by the sovereign loyal people, shall be 
and constitute a part of the permanent constitution of the state of tennessee article one section one that slavery and involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted are hereby forever abolished and prohibited throughout the state section two the legislature shall make no law recognizing the right of property in man the schedule then went on to provide that the convention agreement and military league entered into by the commissioners of the state of tennessee and the commissioners of the so-called confederate states of america made may seventh eighteen sixty one and on the same day ratified and confirmed by the legislature was an act of treason and usurpation unconstitutional null and void the schedule also repudiated the rebel debt and declared void all laws ordinances resolution and acts under the usurped secession government of tennessee and provided further that the proposed amendments to the constitution and the schedule thereto be submitted to the people at the ballot box on the twenty-second day of february next and that upon the adoption thereof by the people an election shall be held on the fourth day of march next for governor and members of the legislature the latter to be voted for by general ticket upon the basis prescribed in the act apportioning representation in the state passed on the nineteenth of february eighteen fifty two to assemble at the capitol on the first monday in april next said officers to continue in office until their successors shall be elected and qualified under the regular biennial election of eighteen sixty seven it is needless to describe in detail the further progress of reconstruction proceedings in tennessee on february twenty fifth governor johnson proclaimed that the election had been held and the amendments to the constitution adopted on february twenty two the election of william g brownlow as governor and of a union legislature followed on the fourth of march on the third of april the legislature met at nashville and in a few days thereafter the governor was inaugurated and a general civil government formally begun among the early acts of the legislature was one to ratify the thirteenth amendment to the constitution of the united states and in due time united states senators were elected and provisions made for choosing members of congress who were regularly elected by the people in the following august end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of abraham lincoln a history volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay chapter nineteen maryland free the notable military events which occurred in the state of maryland during the last three years of the war connect themselves more with the general history of the union than with the local history of the state and in reviewing the latter political results become the dominant feature the power of rebellion in maryland was effectually broken during the year eighteen sixty one the union party formed and maintained a solid organization and on november sixth in that year elected augustus w bradford governor by a majority of thirty one thousand four hundred and twelve for a term of four years to succeed governor hicks at the same election a legislature was chosen with an overwhelming majority of union members governor bradford was inaugurated on the eighth of january eighteen sixty two and his inaugural message declared in the most outspoken terms against secession and for maintaining the union by a vigorous prosecution of the war 
next to the question between union and secession the question of emancipation was brought to popular attention in maryland at a very early period we have seen how president lincoln hoped to induce voluntary action on this subject by his plan of compensated abolishment first suggested to her leading politicians and afterwards officially recommended to congress and it was this policy which directly brought about the formation of new party divisions in the state by the census of eighteen sixty the population of maryland was white five hundred and fifteen thousand nine hundred and eighteen free colored eighty three thousand nine hundred and forty two slave eighty seven thousand one hundred and eighty nine it was therefore slavery traditions rather than money value in slaves which created the strength of pro-slavery sentiment and the political influence of the institution the fact also needs to be noted that the numbers of slaves and free colored persons were nearly equal a condition producing special influences of peculiar power in the anti-slavery movement which the war called into action under such conditions the whole colored population was more intelligent more active and more self-reliant than in dense slave communities and both the desire and the opportunities for escape from bondage were greatly increased amid the confusion of war and the presence of armies it has been elsewhere stated that the president and the local military commanders for a while discouraged or forbade the presence of negro runaways in military camps but this was only a temporary check and was practically discontinued after the first year of the war the army finding more serious work to do than returning fugitive slaves to their masters and it was at length formally prohibited by the act of congress of march thirteenth eighteen sixty two when therefore president lincoln announced his policy of compensated emancipation in the spring of eighteen sixty two maryland unionists who belonged to the conservative or slaveholding class were moved to oppose it not alone by their lifelong hatred of abolition but also by the constant irritation of the escape of their slaves their prejudices blinded them too much to see that this was the exact reason which should have induced them heartily to accept and second it at mr lincoln's first interview with the border state delegations on march tenth eighteen sixty two to propose his policy only two of the maryland representatives were present cornelius l l leary and j w crisfield and they gave him little encouragement the reluctance they expressed seemed based more upon pride than economical expediency mr crisfield said he did not think the people of maryland looked upon slavery as a permanent institution and he did not know that they would be very reluctant to give it up if provision was made to meet the loss and they could be rid of the race but they did not like to be coerced into emancipation either by the direct action of the government or by indirection as through the emancipation of slaves in this district of columbia or the confiscation of southern property as now threatened and when assured by the president that no coercive action was contemplated that he had no present design beyond his patriotic appeal to them mr crisfield further said mr president if what you now say could be heard by the people of maryland they would consider your proposition with a much better feeling than i fear without it they will be inclined to do it would appear however that little could be expected from the maryland union representatives at that time in behalf of the president's policy they had been elected on june thirteenth eighteen sixty one by the party organization which still reflected the conservatism existing before the war and whose single bond of party affiliation was opposition to secession and disunion a condition of political sentiment at that time common to all the border slave states and which was formulated by the crittenden 
resolution none of the maryland representatives had yet become infused with the spirit and independence of the new anti-slavery drift in politics throughout the regular session of congress from december eighteen sixty one to the middle of july eighteen sixty two they were either silent or their votes were recorded against the great anti-slavery measures of that session when after the lapse of four months the president called them to a second interview to hear his renewed appeal in behalf of compensated emancipation they joined the bulk of other border state conservatives in refusing to entertain his policy they pledged themselves anew to the union and the prosecution of the war but urged various reasons why they should have nothing to do with emancipation it was quite natural that the bolder politicians of maryland should seize an opportunity so favorable to begin the organization of a new and more radical party and endeavor to supplant them in popular leadership the question had been brought to the attention of the people of maryland with especial force by the bill pending in congress to emancipate slaves in the district of columbia which was introduced on december sixteenth eighteen sixty one though active discussion of it did not begin till february twenty four the bill passed the senate on april three and the house on april eleven and was signed by the president on april sixteen meanwhile the president had also by his special message of march six recommended his plan of compensated abolishment which congress promptly endorsed public sentiment had at once taken up the question in maryland the first declarations being from conservative opponents of both propositions on the second of january eighteen sixty two the legislature in a series of resolutions expressing confidence in the administration generally and in mr lincoln personally declared that they nevertheless protested against all attempts from whatever quarter to make the present war for the restoration of the union the means of interfering with the domestic institutions of the states again on february twenty two the legislature by another resolution appealed to the northern states to rebuke in an unmistakable manner those of their representatives in congress who are wasting their time in devising schemes for the abolition of slavery in the rebellious states and once more early in march the legislature reaffirmed and commended to congress the language and spirit of the crittenden resolution and declared its apprehension at indications of an interference with the institution of slavery in the slaveholding states though at the same time it reaffirmed its confidence in the wisdom and moderation of the president the popular voice was more specific than these legislative generalities a large meeting was held about the first of april in montgomery county which lies contiguous to the district of columbia and which was therefore peculiarly annoyed by the escape of slaves the resolutions denounced the act to emancipate the slaves in the district of columbia as unwise ill-timed and unconstitutional and as the entering wedge of a general scheme of abolition the latter being evidently regarded as the most serious point of the indictment but conservative views like these did not comprise the whole public sentiment of maryland a convention met in the city of baltimore on may twenty eighth eighteen sixty two composed of delegates from union meetings in the various wards which passed a series of resolutions approving president lincoln's policy of compensated abolishment declaring it to the interest of the people of the state especially its slaveholders to accept the pecuniary aid tendered and favoring the inauguration of such a plan of emancipation and colonization as will be equitable to those interested a more practical and local reform was broached in the long preamble and resolution which closed the series setting forth the inequality and injustice of the existing state apportionment through which the southern counties 
where the slave population was centred containing one-fourth of the population and wealth and paying less than one-fourth of the taxes possessed the virtual control of the whole state sending thirty four out of the seventy-four delegates and fourteen out of twenty-two senators to the legislature alleging further that under this apportionment the slave owners of the state constituting fewer than sixteen thousand individuals virtually wielded its political power and that they demanded a change of the state constitution to correct this unequal representation this was certainly a strong argument in favor of holding a state constitutional convention and doubtless played no unimportant part in stimulating the action of liberal and progressive voters among the class of non-slaveholding whites and particularly among the white laboring population of baltimore during the remainder of the year the party reorganization thus begun was powerfully aided first by the union victory at the battle of antietam and the quick expulsion of the confederate invasion second by president lincoln's preliminary proclamation of emancipation which was issued almost immediately thereafter when in due course the final emancipation proclamation of january one eighteen sixty three appeared the policy of the administration on this subject had become so pronounced and unalterable that it was by mere force of circumstances an unavoidable issue in the politics of every state hitherto conservatives already began to show the influence of the profound movement of public opinion which had taken place and francis thomas one of the maryland representatives in congress so far changed his attitude that on january twelfth eighteen sixty three he introduced a resolution which was agreed to that the committee on emancipation and colonization be instructed to inquire into the expediency of making an appropriation to aid the state of maryland in a system of emancipation and colonization of persons of color inhabitants of said state a bill was introduced on the nineteenth by mr bingham of ohio for the same purpose which was referred to a select committee the committee on february twenty five reported a bill appropriating ten millions to aid maryland emancipation but parliamentary objection was immediately interposed and representative crisfield said that the measure was not asked for by the state of maryland the bill was recommitted and not again reported probably for the reason that the session was almost ended maryland not being ready to accept such a boon congress would not force it upon her as no important election was held in maryland during the year eighteen sixty two political sentiment was not further defined than by the resolutions of the convention which have been mentioned and there being little or no party wreckage to clear away an unusually thorough and radical party reorganization took place in eighteen sixty three there was only one of the union state offices to be filled by general election but the contest over the choice of representatives in congress which usually creates a spirited political activity was in this case supplemented by the deeper struggle over the election of a legislature in which the question of state emancipation was the dominant and far-reaching issue and for which public opinion had been fully ripened by the events of eighteen sixty two the party machinery was still in the hands of the state central committee appointed by the union state convention of may twenty three eighteen sixty one which reflected the conservative unionism of the earlier stages of the war but a vehicle for the expression of more advanced and radical thought of maryland voters was found in the organization of the union leagues within the state and by this instrumentality a convention met in baltimore on june sixteenth eighteen sixty three the call for which had addressed itself to all persons who support the whole policy of the government in suppressing the rebellion 
contemporaneously with this movement the old party organization headed by the state central committee also called a state convention to meet on june twenty three the two bodies being designated respectively the union league convention and the state central committee convention the former being a new organization and not yet possessing full confidence in its own strength had after resolving that the policy of emancipation ought to be inaugurated in maryland adjourned its meeting and reconvened also on the twenty third the rival conventions being now both in session a proposition was submitted by the union league convention that they should bring about harmony of action by joining in a call for a third convention to be held at a future day but there was too much difference in the underlying thought and purpose of each to permit such a fusion the union league convention had declared for emancipation the state central committee convention resolved that this convention ignores all issues local or national but those of war until treason shall succumb before an offended people it therefore declined the tendered overture and the union voters of maryland thus became separated into rival factions one of which was designated union men and the other unconditional union men both parties admitted the imminence of the slavery question but the former sought refuge in delay while the latter urged the policy of boldly grappling with and ending it the convention of the union men so far yielded to the drift of public sentiment as to pass a resolution declaring that the legislature at its next session should make provision for submitting to the people the question of the call for a constitutional convention while in an address which the state central committee issued on september eleventh though they deprecated the present agitation of the emancipation issue they said the immediate emancipationists must be unreasonable indeed if they desire a more rapid change than that which is now going on and has left the institution of slavery within our limits already scarcely worth the trouble of contending for on their part the unconditional union men answered by an address issued on september sixteen disavowing all measures for the violent abrogation of slavery but asserting that the institution should be abolished legally and constitutionally at the earliest moment and retorting that since only the skeleton was left it ought to be removed pending this discussion of local policy by the voters of the state two important questions of military administration arose between the state authorities and the general government one grew out of the system of enlisting negro soldiers for the army which had begun in maryland as in other states and governor bradford wrote the president a long letter complaining that recruiting officers encouraged slaves to abscond and enlist and that owners were not only thus deprived of their labor but that they were in some instances refused access to them to identify their property for the mere purpose of formulating a claim to future indemnity after much discussion the president to some extent relieved this grievance by directing the secretary of war to issue a general order dated october three eighteen sixty three regulating enlistment of colored troops in the states of maryland missouri and tennessee and which was subsequently extended to delaware the order provided that persons so enlisted in the military service should forever thereafter be free that free persons and slaves with the written consent of their owners and slaves belonging to rebels might then be enlisted but if a sufficient number to meet the exigencies of the service were not obtained within thirty days enlistment might be made of slaves without requiring consent of their owners loyal owners were compensated whether they had given their consent or not upon filing deeds of manumission and release and a board was appointed to audit such claims this order gave satisfaction in many directions it helped to fill the army gave slaves an avenue to freedom aided and stimulated state emancipation compensated slave owners and lightened the burden of the draft upon white citizens 
the other question was more difficult of solution though the state of maryland had given continuous and conclusive proof of her dominant loyalty there was no disguising the presence within her limits of a very considerable minority of malignant secessionists who neglected no opportunity to propagate and practise treason and obstruct loyal administration major-general shank who had been placed in military command in maryland on december seventeenth eighteen sixty two found much of his time and vigilance required in ferreting out and repressing secret secession combinations or such open manifestations as evil doers ventured upon while disloyal combinations and plots were prevented by military precautions the secessionists lost no occasion to make a loud outcry and complaint of military oppression and in no particular did their wounded susceptibilities find so convenient a theme for energetic protest as in the charge of apprehended military interference at elections on october twenty sixth eighteen sixty three thomas swan chairman of the state central committee of the union men wrote a letter to the president stating that many union voters of maryland had a suspicion that the coming election on the fourth of november would be attended with undue interference on the part of persons claiming to represent the wishes of the government and asking the president's views on the subject to this mr lincoln replied on october twenty seven as follows your letter a copy of which is on the other half of this sheet is received i trust there is no just ground for the suspicion you mention and i am somewhat mortified that there could be any doubt of my views upon the point of your inquiry i wish all loyal qualified voters in maryland and elsewhere to have the undisturbed privilege of voting at elections and neither my authority nor my name can be properly used to the contrary but the conservative party was disposed to magnify every pretext for complaint and would not rest satisfied with the general declarations the president had laid down in his answer four days later governor bradford wrote to him reporting rumors that detachments of soldiers are to be dispatched on monday next to several of the counties of the state with a view of being present at their polls on wednesday next the day of our state election and his apprehension that these military detachments if sent are expected to exert some control or influence in that election i am also informed continued the governor that orders are to be issued from this military department on monday presenting certain restrictions or qualifications in the right of suffrage of what precise character i am not apprised which the judges of election will be expected to observe it is unnecessary to quote in full the military order of general shank to which the governor alluded in substance it gave the following directions one that provost marshals and other military officers should arrest disloyal persons found at or hanging about or approaching any poll or place of election two that provost marshals and military officers should support judges of election in requiring an oath of allegiance to the united states as the test of citizenship of any one whose vote may be challenged on the ground that he is not loyal three that provost marshals and military officers should report judges of election refusing to require such an oath after an interview with general shank on the subject the president made the following reply to governor bradford in which the reciprocal rights and obligations of individual voters on the one hand and the government authorities on the other are set forth with that specific minuteness and clearness of analysis and definition which never failed him in this class of controversies yours of the thirty first ultimate was received yesterday about noon and since then i have been giving most earnest attention to the subject matter of it at my call general shank has attended and he assures me it is almost certain that violence will be used at some of the voting places on election day unless prevented by his provost guards 
he says that at some of those places union voters will not attend at all or run a ticket unless they have some assurance of protection this makes the missouri case of my action in regard to which you express your approval the remaining point of your letter is a protest against any person offering to vote being put to any test not found in the laws of maryland this brings us to a difference between missouri and maryland with the same reason in both states missouri has by law provided a test for the voter with reference to the present rebellion while maryland has not for example general trimble captured fighting us at gettysburg is without recanting his treason a legal voter by the laws of maryland even general shank's order admits him to vote if he recants upon oath i think that is cheap enough my order in missouri which you approve and general shank's order here reach precisely the same end each assures the right of voting to all loyal men and whether a man is loyal each allows that man to fix by his own oath your suggestion that nearly all the candidates are loyal i do not think quite meets the case in this struggle for the nation's life i cannot so confidently rely on those whose elections may have depended upon disloyal votes such men when elected may prove true but such votes are given them in the expectation that they will prove false nor do i think that to keep the peace at the polls and to prevent the persistently disloyal from voting constitutes just cause of offence to maryland i think she has her own example for it if i mistake not it is precisely what general dix did when your excellency was elected governor i revoke the first of the three propositions in general shank's general order number fifty three not that it is wrong in principle but because the military being of necessity exclusive judges as to who shall be arrested the provision is too liable to abuse for the revoked part i substitute the following that all provost marshals and other military officers do prevent all disturbance and violence at or about the polls whether offered by such persons as above described or by any other person or persons whomsoever the other two propositions of the order i allow to stand general shank is fully determined and has my strict orders besides that all loyal men may vote and vote for whom they please before receiving the president's letter governor bradford had issued a proclamation stating his criticism of general shank's order and admonishing judges of election that their own judgment must determine the right to vote of any person offering himself for that purpose undeterred by any orders to provost marshals to report them to headquarters which he supplemented by a letter citing and acknowledging the revocation made by the president but expressing his regret that he could perceive no such change in the general principles of the order as to induce me to change the foregoing proclamation to this general shank retorted with a supplementary order repeating his directions to his provost guards to carry out his own and the president's instructions it was natural that such a war of words should ensue to relieve the irritated tempers of the governor and the general but it evidently had little effect except to confirm the adherence of each in the political views to which prior causes had brought them the governor and his friends may be pardoned for having continued to nurse and utter their unnecessary and ill-timed complaints for at the election which was held november four their party suffered a decisive defeat the conservative union candidate for comptroller received a vote of fifteen thousand nine hundred and eighty four the unconditional union or emancipation candidate thirty six thousand three hundred and sixty out of the five congressmen chosen four 
were unconditional unionists and of the legislature which was elected the emancipationists had a decided majority in the house and a practical majority in the senate the new legislature met at annapolis on january sixth eighteen sixty four and during the ensuing month amid the usual party and parliamentary strategy and debate upon collateral points perfected and passed a bill which provided for holding an election on april sixth eighteen sixty four submitting to the voters of maryland the question of convention or no convention and also providing for electing delegates to a state convention to amend the constitution mr lincoln followed with unabated interest the growth of liberal sentiment in maryland which promised to put an end to slavery giving it his constant personal encouragement on march seventeenth he wrote to mr cresswell one of the newly chosen members of congress it needs not to be a secret that i wish success to emancipation in maryland it would aid much to end the rebellion hence it is a matter of national consequence in which every national man may rightfully feel a deep interest i sincerely hope the friends of the measure will allow no minor considerations to divide and distract them as the election came on the usual controversy between secessionists and the military authorities about permission to become candidates and to vote was renewed but the correspondence on the subject between governor bradford and general lew wallace who had succeeded general shank was in better temper owing to the evident drift of public opinion and especially to the additional duties and powers which the convention act of the legislature imposed on judges of election when the popular vote was taken the question of emancipation gained another signal success there was a majority of more than twelve thousand in favor of holding the convention and of the delegates elected sixty-one were emancipationists and only thirty-five opposed accordingly the convention met at annapolis on april twenty seventh eighteen sixty four and its sessions were prolonged by animated debate until the sixth of september long before this however the main question which had called it into existence was decided the convention having on june twenty four by a vote of yeas fifty three nays twenty seven adopted an article declaring that hereafter in this state there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except in punishment of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted and all persons held to service or labor as slaves are hereby declared free this vote of the convention in favor of abolishing the institution was so decisive that though the body remained in session more than two months longer no effort seems to have been made by the minority to reverse or rescind its action the constitution as a whole was adopted on september sixth eighteen sixty four fifty three to twenty five though thirty five of the delegates afterwards joined in a protest against it the new instrument thereupon went to the people at large and during the ensuing month was vigorously discussed in public by the strong parties which arrayed themselves for and against it the influence of president lincoln being invoked to aid in this popular contest he wrote the following letter to henry w hoffman on october ten two days before the vote was taken a convention of maryland has framed a new constitution for the state a public meeting is called for this evening at baltimore to aid in securing its ratification by the people and you ask a word from me for the occasion i presume the only feature of the instrument about which there is serious controversy is that which provides for the extinction of slavery it needs not to be a secret and i presume it is no secret that i wish success to this provision i desire it on every consideration i wish all men to be free 
i wish the material prosperity of the already free which i feel sure the extinction of slavery would bring i wish to see in process of disappearing that only thing which ever could bring this nation to civil war i attempt no argument argument upon the question is already exhausted by the abler better informed and more immediately interested sons of maryland herself i only add that i shall be gratified exceedingly if the good people of the state shall by their votes ratify the new constitution in accordance with the schedule adopted by the convention the popular vote for and against the new constitution was taken on october twelfth and thirteenth eighteen sixty four and proved one of the most closely contested elections held in maryland during the war rigid provisions had been adopted to prevent disloyal persons from voting and liberal provisions for taking the vote of maryland soldiers on the question at whatever camp or station they might be serving the result was a vote of thirty thousand one hundred and seventy four for and twenty nine thousand seven hundred and ninety nine against the new constitution though the majority of only three hundred and seventy five votes out of a total of nearly sixty thousand was a very narrow victory for emancipation the result seems to have been accepted by the defeated party without serious opposition a case was taken to the court of appeals on the question of the governor's discretion in ascertaining the result the object being to throw out the soldier's vote and thus defeat the constitution but the decision sustained the vote and on october twenty nine governor bradford issued his proclamation definitely announcing that the new constitution had been legally adopted and would go into effect on the first of november in accordance with this announcement the new constitution became operative and slavery ceased to exist in maryland however small was the majority by which the result was attained it was in entire harmony with the manifest popular will of the state for within the succeeding month occurred the presidential election of eighteen sixty four at which maryland cast forty thousand one hundred and fifty three votes for lincoln and thirty two thousand seven hundred and thirty nine for mcclellan giving the president who had prompted an aided state emancipation a popular majority of seven thousand four hundred and fourteen and electing a republican governor and three republican members of congress out of five and a new legislature with a majority of twenty two republicans on joint ballot the remarkable transformation of maryland by the war can be realized by recalling that at the presidential election of eighteen sixty only two thousand two hundred and ninety four ballots had been cast for lincoln the total then being less than one-third of his majority in eighteen sixty four end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of abraham lincoln a history volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay chapter twenty missouri free the temporary quiet which had been reached in missouri between the radicals and general schofield about the time of the november election in eighteen sixty three soon suffered a new interruption the legislature of the state met at jefferson city on november ten and the two principal questions before that body were the election of united states senators and the passage of an act to call a state convention to deal with the subject of emancipation the legislature was composed of members chosen a year before excepting that some vacancies had occurred which were filled at the recent election but several circumstances probably served to change its temper at the session of the previous winter neither faction having a controlling majority an effort to elect united states senators for the two existing vacancies and the following term had only partially succeeded 
the radicals claimed that their candidate for supreme judge of missouri had received a majority in the state of about seventeen hundred votes though the official count through technical informalities of certain ballots awarded the certificate of election to the conservative candidate with the chances of success thus evenly divided and vibrating between the two both parties were put on their good behaviour a balance however that was soon destroyed by the death of governor gamble which occurred on the thirty first of january eighteen sixty four through this the conservative party lost its most conspicuous leader and from that time forward rapidly declined in prestige and numerical strength the first of these legislative contests was disposed of on the fourth day of the session by the election of b gratz brown the leading radical for the vacancy to succeed wilson and of john b henderson a conservative but also a hardy emancipationist for the coming full term to succeed himself to the united states senate president lincoln was greatly pleased at this result which appeared to him the forerunner of such cooperation in missouri as would secure an earlier and more substantial measure of emancipation than that adopted by the old state convention on the first of july previous in this he was not disappointed the radicals could not command a working majority of the members but a sufficient number of them had become convinced that slavery was doomed and were agreed that a convention should be held a parliamentary struggle however occurred over the time when it ought to be elected the radicals desired that the convention should be chosen and an emancipation ordinance adopted without delay but in this they failed and an act was passed which became a law on the thirteenth of february eighteen sixty four for submitting the question of convention or no convention to a popular vote in the following november and for the election at the same time of delegates with authority to act upon this and other enumerated subjects violent as had been the attacks of the radicals upon general schofield it was perhaps more than one could expect of human nature that with his vast and varied powers of administration he would remain entirely neutral in these new political contests and complaints of his interference began to reach the president mr lincoln's intimate friend washburn of illinois reported to him that he had held a conversation with the general advising him to use his influence to harmonize the conflicting elements so as to elect one senator from each wing gratz brown and henderson schofield's reported reply was that he would not consent to the election of gratz brown again when gratz brown after his election was about coming to washington he sent a friend to schofield to say that he would not oppose his confirmation as major-general if he schofield would so far as his influence extended agree to a convention of missouri to make necessary alterations in her state constitution schofield's reply as reported by brown to the president was that he would not consent to a state convention these things the president said are obviously transcendent of his instructions and must not be permitted and he sent for schofield to come to washington and explain the facts but the president also saw that schofield's mere interference was not the most troublesome point the reports brought to him by washburn and by gratz brown as of their personal knowledge would either be admitted or denied by the general if admitted he could not escape blame if denied the truthfulness of the president's trusted friend and that of the newly elected senator would be impugned the culmination of this difficulty and mr lincoln's tact in dealing with it are fully set forth in his letter to the secretary of war of december eighteen eighteen sixty three i believe general schofield must be relieved from command of the department of missouri 
otherwise a question of veracity in relation to his declarations as to his interfering or not with the missouri legislature will be made with him which will create an additional amount of trouble not to be overcome by even a correct decision of the question the question itself must be avoided now for the mode senator henderson his friend thinks he can be induced to ask to be relieved if he shall understand he will be generously treated and on this latter point gratz brown will help his nomination as a major-general through the senate in no other way can he be confirmed and upon his rejection alone it would be difficult for me to sustain him as commander of the department besides his being relieved from command of the department and at the same time confirmed as a major-general will be the means of henderson and brown leading off together as friends and will go far to heal the missouri difficulty another point i find it is scarcely less than indispensable for me to do something for general rosecrans and i find henderson and brown will agree to him for the commander of their department again i have received such evidence and explanations in regard to the supposed cotton transactions of general curtis as fully restores in my mind the fair presumption of his innocence and as he is my friend and what is more as i think the country's friend i would be glad to relieve him from the impression that i think him dishonest by giving him a command most of the iowa and kansas delegations a large part of that of missouri and the delegates from nebraska and colorado ask this in behalf of general c and suggest kansas and other contiguous territory west of missouri as a department for him in a purely military point of view it may be that none of these things are indispensable or perhaps advantageous but in another aspect scarcely less important they would give great relief while at the worst i think they could not injure the military service much i therefore shall be greatly obliged if yourself and general halleck can give me your hearty cooperation in making the arrangement perhaps the first thing would be to send general schofield's nomination to me let me hear from you before you take any actual step in the matter it would seem that stanton and halleck were not quite agreed to the changes proposed by the president for three days later december twenty one mr lincoln again wrote to the secretary of war in regard to the western matter i believe the program will have to stand substantially as i first put it henderson and especially brown believed that the social influence of st louis would inevitably tell injuriously upon general pope in the particular difficulty existing there and i think there is some force in that view as to retaining general s schofield temporarily if this should be done i believe i should scarcely be able to get his nomination through the senate send me over his nomination which however i am not yet quite ready to send to the senate the remaining obstacle appears to have been removed and stanton and halleck evidently yielded to the president's wish for two days later general schofield was duly nominated to the senate to be a major-general but mr lincoln's difficulties were not at an end in his various interviews with gratz brown he had understood him to fully agree to the proposed transfer and he was much surprised to learn that that senator though perhaps keeping his technical promise not to personally oppose the confirmation was secretly encouraging others in opposition schofield's confirmation was secured only after some weeks of delay and upon mr lincoln's further solicitation he explained to senators wilkinson and chandler that grant and sherman for reasons which he did not understand disliked rosecrans but that on the contrary they had a high opinion of schofield and wished him to command a corps in their army that also while schofield displeased the radicals in missouri they would be satisfied with rosecrans and that the transfer would thus not only set matters at ease in both these places but would gratify the friends of schofield by his promotion and the friends of rosecrans by the important command he would thus receive it is needless to say writes wilkinson that when the senate fully grasped 
the plan of the president in this regard there was no longer any opposition to the confirmation of schofield the military administration of general rosecrans in missouri was thus begun in january eighteen sixty four under favoring conditions with the senatorial election completed and a new state convention provided the violent controversies of the previous year abated somewhat by a natural reaction but there existed so many latent elements of dissension and provocation that new difficulties were continually springing up for the better control of certain disloyal influences the general had deemed it necessary to issue an order through his provost marshal general that the members of the larger representative organizations of the various churches such as conventions synods and councils should before transacting their business take and subscribe an oath of allegiance to the united states this was resented by some of them as imposing a qualification not of a political but of a religious character the president deprecated every such restraint which was not seriously demanded and upon complaint he wrote the general the following mild admonition on the subject this is rather more social than official containing suggestions rather than orders i somewhat dread the effect of your special order number sixty one dated march seven eighteen sixty four i have found that men who have not even been suspected of disloyalty are very averse to taking an oath of any sort as a condition to exercising an ordinary right of citizenship the point will probably be made that while men may without an oath assemble in a noisy political meeting they must take the oath to assemble in a religious meeting it is said i know not whether truly that in some parts of missouri assassinations are systematically committed upon returned rebels who wish to ground arms and behave themselves this should not be of course i have not heard that you give countenance to or wink at such assassinations again it is complained that the enlistment of negroes is not conducted in as orderly a manner and with as little collateral provocation as it might be so far you have got along in the department of the missouri rather better than i dare to hope and i congratulate you and myself upon it military conditions like those in the political world were more favorable at this time in missouri as indeed they had become throughout the whole union the strength of the rebellion was everywhere declining east of the alleghanies general grant was beginning his great campaign against richmond in tennessee sherman was starting on his famous campaign through the heart of the south west of the mississippi the union forces had at the chief point such preponderant strength as left them free to take the initiative and a combined movement to ascend the red river and occupy eastern texas was in progress no confederate force was therefore free to threaten or invade missouri during the early months of the year eighteen sixty four although by the disasters which befell the red river expedition this came about later in the year the attention of general rosecrans was thus mainly taken up with local military administration in which the criticisms of the missouri factions upon him never became so extreme as they had been upon his predecessors for the moment the radicals declared themselves satisfied with him while the conservatives merely accused him of inefficiency and not of political bias this branch of the quarrel between the factions expended itself mainly on the party movements preliminary to the presidential nominations both the radicals and conservatives held their state conventions about the same time to appoint delegates to the republican national convention at baltimore each however accusing the other of designs adverse to mr lincoln's renomination it was alleged that the radical delegates would go to baltimore and demand as a condition of their adhesion that lincoln must reorganize his cabinet by dismissing bates blair and seward 
and that in addition a portion of them had sent a delegation with senator b gratz brown as active manager to the cleveland national convention to control the freemonters of that body in the interest of mr chase's candidacy on their part one of the principal leaders of the radicals wrote to the president in connection with a protest against the removal of general rosecrans from command though i do not think you have in times past treated the missouri radicals as kindly as you ought yet i desire and so do they except the german freemonters that the vote of this state should be cast for you i am one of the candidates for elector in the state at large and expect to do my part toward securing that result but all effort will be hopeless if it should appear that you yield in so important a matter to the solicitations of our adversaries almost every one of whom will in due time be found ranged under the standard of the chicago nominee you cannot afford thus to throw away the vote of missouri nor can the loyal men of missouri bear for a moment the thought of being trampled under the feet of the disloyal it turned out in the end that these factional movements and intrigues depended more upon drifts and currents of party feeling among the masses of their followers than upon the designs of individual leaders and that none of the several predictions were wholly verified senator b gratz brown and the more influential missouri delegates appointed to the cleveland convention neglected to attend the labors of that meeting turned to barrenness and its nominee withdrew from the canvass the conservative delegation to baltimore was excluded from and the radical delegation admitted to the republican national convention and the latter was the only delegation which cast its vote against mr lincoln's renomination under instructions they voted for ulysses s grant but immediately on the whole vote being declared they moved to make mr lincoln's nomination unanimous and it was done the bulk of the missouri conservatives with all their loud professions of support to the administration voted the mcclellan ticket while the missouri radicals as a party refusing till the last moment to acknowledge lincoln as their candidate nevertheless gave him the electoral vote of the state the summer thus passed away and the presidential canvass went on in missouri with no very marked incidents except the repetition of an annual rebel invasion this time again under leadership of general price who clung with pertinacity to his hallucination that missouri was rebel in sentiment and he her chosen deliverer after the union defeats in louisiana and the return of the red river expedition price gathered a force of ten or twelve thousand rebel cavalry in arkansas and moving rapidly northward entered southeast missouri thus changing his point of attack driving the union garrison out of pilot knob about september twenty six which delayed him by a determined resistance he next showed an intention of capturing st louis advancing a part of his forces to within a few miles of the city in this project however he failed by a hasty arming of the citizens as well as by the presence of an infantry division under general a j smith sent from cairo turning north and westward the rebels next threatened jefferson city but finding this also guarded they continued their course along the missouri river capturing boonville glasgow lexington and independence their march was greatly aided by the rising of guerrillas and bushwhackers along their route one band of these under a notorious outlaw called bill anderson atrociously massacred two parties of union prisoners they had captured and disarmed but they were followed and the leader killed a few days later meanwhile the various union detachments were being so rapidly concentrated against price that he began a retreat southward along the kansas border which was soon changed to precipitate flight a column of union cavalry under pleasanton fought the enemy in several sharp engagements and in one of them captured price's artillery eight guns and the rebel generals marmaduke and cabell with a thousand prisoners while the pursuit of the invaders was continued into arkansas 
the large accessions which price's invading column temporarily gained from rebel sympathizers were more than counterbalanced by the fidelity and vigor with which the union citizens either as enrolled militia or in other organizations assisted and reinforced the military detachments general grant afterwards rather harshly criticized general rosecrans for the impunity with which price was enabled to roam over the state of missouri for a long time but the history of the war had shown that heavy columns of veteran cavalry were not easily prevented from making raids of this character especially when as in this case they were willing to encounter the risk of gradual depletion and dispersion there seems little doubt that the raid was as much political as military all the summer general rosecrans had been receiving information of a movement of conspiracy in the state nursed by the order of american knights it was doubtless a part of that more general political conspiracy of secret associations extending through several northwestern states by members of this and similarly affiliated societies whose mischievous plottings and attempts inspired by the rebel authorities of richmond through their agents in canada are elsewhere related upon one point general rosecrans gave the radical party of missouri unfeigned satisfaction and as his action was in strict accordance with the instructions of the president and doubtless of his own judgment as well we may here quote mr lincoln's letter on the subject one cannot always safely disregard a report even which one may not believe i have a report that you incline to deny the soldiers the right of attending the election in missouri on the assumed ground that they will get drunk and make disturbance last year i sent general schofield a letter of instruction dated october one eighteen sixty three which i suppose you will find on the files of the department and which contains among other things the following at elections see that those and only those are allowed to vote who are entitled to do so by the laws of missouri including as of those laws the restrictions laid by the missouri convention upon those who may have participated in the rebellion this i thought right then and think right now and i may add i do not remember that either party complained after the election of general schofield's action under it wherever the law allows soldiers to vote their officers must also allow it please write me on this subject the orders of general schofield in the previous year simply used the phraseology qualified voters and forbade their intimidation or exclusion the order which general rosecrans issued to govern the election of eighteen sixty four went a step further and interpreting existing laws explained that this excludes from the right of voting all who since that date december seventeenth eighteen sixty one have been in the rebel army or navy anywhere and all who since that date have been anywhere engaged in guerrilla marauding or bushwhacking reciting that the civil power was too weak to execute laws and punish offenders he declared that violations of the election laws would be punished as military offenses and that he would punish election officers as severely for wilful neglect of their duty as for its violation on the subject of soldiers voting the general's response to the president was earnest and satisfactory i should be untrue wrote he to the instincts convictions and professions of my life if i did not sacredly respect the right of franchise which lies at the foundation of our free government i should be doubly so were i to prevent or even neglect to facilitate voting by the noble and patriotic citizens who for the sacred cause of the union law and justice have become soldiers under my command whenever and wherever the laws of the state permit it it is sufficient to add that the careful provisions of the general's election order amply fulfilled his promise to publish one which would give satisfaction to all honest union men better however than the general's stringent military order was the great tide of anti-slavery conversion which sweeping over the north nowhere rose to a more surprising height than in this guerrilla haunted and war-smitten state 
the presidential nominations almost wholly changed the attitude of the factions towards each other the conservative party as such practically disappeared its voters of democratic antecedents returned to the democratic party and supported mcclellan its voters of whig and republican origin little by little fused with the radicals the political conditions and prospects became every way satisfactory to the president and his friends except upon a single point such important gains of republican members of the house of representatives had been made in the october elections in indiana ohio and pennsylvania as to afford reasonable promise that with continued success a two-thirds vote might perhaps be secured which would have power to propose to the states an amendment of the national constitution abolishing slavery throughout the union at this critical juncture a personal controversy about the nomination of candidates in the first congressional district of missouri had most unseasonably put two candidates in the field which would inevitably ensure the election of a democrat who would as certainly vote against such a constitutional amendment in this aspect of affairs mr lincoln deemed it his duty to interfere and sent one of his secretaries to st louis with a confidential message to the federal office holders belonging to the conservative faction that they must not labor and vote to defeat the emancipation candidates even though these called themselves radicals and were opposing his re-election to the presidency it turned out that the controversy about the nomination for congressman in the first district could not be composed and the democrat was elected as had been foreseen but in all other respects the election simplified the confusion of the missouri factions in a most refreshing manner in the previous november when the issue had been between radicals and conservatives without further definition of party creed the vote had been nearly equal but in the new issue between lincoln and mcclellan between the baltimore platform and the chicago surrender between prosecuting the war to success and declaring it a failure the result was an overwhelming triumph for the former lincoln received seventy two thousand seven hundred and fifty votes mcclellan thirty one thousand six hundred and seventy eight giving the president a majority of forty one thousand seventy two or of more than one-third the radical candidate for governor was elected by about the same majority of the congressmen elected eight out of the nine were radicals the solitary exception being in the first district where the foolish personal quarrel had thrown away victory a large majority of the legislature was radical the radical ticket was successful in eighty out of the one hundred and fourteen counties in the state and finally there was a majority vote of thirty seven thousand seven hundred and ninety three for the convention and three-fourths of the delegates elected to form it were also of the radical party the political revolution in the state of missouri was complete and irrevocable and it is only necessary to record the official embodiment of the popular decision the new constitutional convention met according to law at the city of st louis on the sixth of january eighteen sixty five and on the sixth day of its session january eleven it formally adopted an ordinance that hereafter in this state there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except in punishment of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted and all persons held to service or labor as slaves are hereby declared free a telegraphic announcement of the event was sent to the legislature at jefferson city and in jubilation over the news the lower house of that body by a formal resolution turned from weightier business to greet with immense applause the singing of the famous war song john brown's body we can best measure the change which had been wrought in public opinion when we remember that this took place in the hall where less than four years before governor jackson and his rebel legislature belted with bowie knives and pistols and with rifles leaning on their desks concocted their treasonable enactments through a long night in a mockery of parliamentary forms also that this constitutional ordinance of immediate and unrecompensed emancipation was 
was now the mandatory will of two-thirds of the voters of missouri a state whose public opinion had tolerated if not justified the violation of law in almost every form by a portion of its citizens less than ten years before in order to compel the neighboring territory of kansas to adopt the institution of slavery yet it must not be hastily inferred that the passage of this ordinance of emancipation immediately restored peace and prosperity about a month later we find president lincoln writing the following letter to the new governor who had been elected and inaugurated to replace the provisional government it seems that there is now no organized military force of the enemy in missouri and yet that destruction of property and life is rampant everywhere is not the cure for this within easy reach of the people themselves it cannot but be that every man not naturally a robber or cutthroat would gladly put an end to this state of things a large majority in every locality must feel alike upon this subject and if so they only need to reach an understanding one with another each leaving all others alone solves the problem and surely each would do this but for his apprehension that others will not leave him alone cannot this mischievous distrust be removed let neighborhood meetings be everywhere called and held of all entertaining a sincere purpose for mutual security in the future whatever they may heretofore have thought said or done about the war or about anything else let all such meet and waiving all else pledge each to cease harassing others and to make common cause against whoever persists in making aiding or encouraging further disturbance the practical means they will best know how to adopt and apply at such meetings old friendships will cross the memory and honor and christian charity will come in to help please consider whether it may not be well to suggest this to the now afflicted people of missouri the action of the new governor in response to this appeal was not all that might have been desired he did not call the neighborhood meetings suggested by the president's letter but in his proclamation of march seventh eighteen sixty five merely invited all men who have not made themselves infamous by crime to unite together for the support of the officers of the law and admonished courts and officers to greater vigilance and activity how long the fires of these chronic neighborhood feuds might have blazed or smouldered cannot even be surmised for new events mightier than any mere local efforts were destined to bring them to a sudden termination end of chapter twenty end of abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay